Life's better when you're empty inside. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Caroline. So that the listeners um, know, just having having some context, I first found out about you through your book, Positively Caroline, which is all about recovering from bulimia. Uh, and then I found out after reading that that you'd also written an earlier memoir, My Name is Caroline, which I believe was the first memoir ever to the point of view of somebody with bulimia. Is that correct? It was the first autobiography by anybody who got better from bulimia and lived to tell the story. Yeah. That's incredible. What, what, what was the impact of that like? It must have just been um, mind-blowing. I, I, I just, there was no way to prepare for what happened. It was like a bomb going off in my house. It was, um, I, I wrote the book to help people have hope and get better. And then the world got in touch with me. Um, I was written about in Dear Abby. I mean, the entire post office in Baltimore came out holding boxes of letters. Oh my um, God. Were so, uh, it was, was very, very humbling, but it was what I wanted to do was to just connect with people. I just had no idea how pent up the demand was for people that just have somebody to talk to. So um, I, it was hundreds of thousands of letters and I still get them. And I, now it's emails and phone calls, but um, I answered every single person because every single person said I was the first person that they'd ever told. And that was something I took really seriously. Wow. Yeah. For, I don't, I, I feel like now, luckily the conversation about eating disorders is expanding a bit, but still it seems like such, I mean, there's, it's just inherently such a secretive thing and such a shameful thing that anybody who's experienced one or is experiencing one is going through that I feel like there's just this instant camaraderie with somebody that you know has been there and a, a real true sense of hope if you know that they've gotten to the other side. You know, it's a, it's a, that is a fraught topic right there because I, having been in this position for 35 some years, I, I feel very strongly the people who want to come out and tell their story need to have at least enough recovery that when the poll starts, because you will be pulled at, people will, reporters would go through my refrigerator. I mean, people watch me grocery shop. You have to be, um, you have to be in strong enough recovery that you can take the scrutiny. Otherwise, you've outed yourself and provided hope for people. And then if you relapse publicly or at all, suddenly people will think, well, that's what happens. Why try? And that mm -hmm. happened a lot. A hundred percent. I actually, I wrote this piece for Huffington Post a few, like a year and a half ago. And before publishing that piece, I wanted to make sure that I was in a really solid place of recovery because I knew that I was sort of essentially throwing myself to the wolves. And now anybody can say anything. And to your point, I knew people would be looking at my grocery cart and oh, well, constantly monitoring. Well, what if she's lost weight? What if she's gained weight? And I knew I had to be able to withstand all of that. And from my own judgment and my own recovery, I'm curious to hear from you if there was any, I had a little um, hesitance and concern about posting anything because I, I, I didn't want, this is really, it's, it's, it's wild to say, but there was that little kind of itch of the eating disorder voice that was like, well, but once you say that you're recovered, you can't slip. Was That's there anything for you? Well, that is another huge topic right there. Cause when I, when I, when my book came out in 88, um, there was a big discussion about the fact that you can only be recovering because I took my cue from Betty Ford, who was also published by Double Day. And I went to a lot of AA meetings and I also got sober at the time. So I was mm. following the guidelines of both Betty Ford, who told Double Day four years of recovery before you buy this woman's book. She needs to be in really solid recovery. So th that was a wait period. And then it was recovering because we were following alcoholics. And after about 15, 20 years of nonstop recovery, no slips, no relapse, no sort of Damocles over my head, I started to think we've got this all wrong in this field. And I do think there's some real Achilles heels in the eating disorder world that I can share with you because I've, I've kept an eye on it just because I think we're a little behind other addiction fields. But I think the whole idea that we have to keep saying recovering might keep people in a hopeless state or poised for relapse. I think our recovery is probably more difficult than a lot of other recoveries simply because we have to eat, hand to mouth, feed children, you know, all day long. So 
I finally said I was recovered and it caused a little bit of a stir, but it is what it is. I'm in full recovery. There's no chance I'm going to go backwards. Not zip, zero, none. I'm so happy to hear you say this and to cover this point because you are the first person I have, I might even get emotional here. You are the first person I've seen who has had that point of view. And it's, it was really frustrating for me because I felt like, I think I'm recovered, but I can't say it because we have to always be in recovery and it's always constant work. And I was like, it doesn't feel like this arduous, difficult thing anymore. And of course I know what that looked like because recovery is, I think in many ways, as difficult as having an eating disorder. Cause you're, for me, it was like, I was facing myself and the emotions that I was suppressing through the coping mechanism of the eating disorder for the first time. But right. then I got to the other side of that. I was like, so now I just need to always be in recovery. And like, I'm, I don't feel tormented by those demons anymore. And then there you are saying it. And I'm so happy. That's part of your overall message. It really is. I mean, I had to get through three pregnancies, getting through it, then middle age, then menopause, and just got whatever I weigh, which I don't know, is probably the same thing I've weighed since I stopped weighing myself 35 years ago. And I think, you know, people would say, well, you got to expect you're going to relapse when you're, when you're pregnant or when you're nursing or when you, you know, you get into middle age or that whatever, whatever, whatever. And I kept thinking, wait a minute, if your recovery is solid, you know, sure, things might shift around a little bit, but really nothing's changed. And that message has simply not gotten out there. And that's why I wrote Positively Caroline. I was so struck by the fact that nobody had written about mature recovery or long-term recovery, that there were still all these articles about how hopeless it was. It just, it wasn't possible to get in recovery and stay, stay in recovery. I still think there's a huge broad swath of people in the addiction field who think that maybe I'm a unicorn or it can't happen. I believe this can be the norm if we set it up to be the norm. Why do you think that it's so common for the messaging to be, no, it's always going to be difficult. No, you're always in recovery. You're never recovered. Um, maybe because you have to eat and there's this idea that somehow people can't abstain or they can't get into a solid meal plan or, it, you know, there's also a feeling, and I think this is one of the addictions that is so overwhelmingly female, that there's a message that we're always broken in one way or another. We have to lean in. We have to keep working at recovery. We've got to dress differently. We've got to interrupt more. I mean, there's always something more we have to do. And I really think this is part of what has kept women's voices silent and confused and doubting themselves for a very long time. And, and you know what? We live at this amazing inflection point in history where women are finding their voices. And this is one area that has to change. And thank goodness you have taken this on in many ways as a cause because of the, the huge, broad reach of your audience. Think of how much hope you're going to give people. It's remarkable. Oh, thank you so much. For just to give the listeners some context, would you mind kind of, I feel like a, a good place to, to sort of start is if you give a rundown of your history with eating disorders, just kind of that timeline. It's, I know it's always a tricky one. No, it's kind of cut and dry. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, uh, the kind of, I think I'm the only, the only person who's ever laid out the moment I got into an eating disorder, the moment I got into long-term recovery and folks, I don't think anyone else has done it. So it's out there. And so it's very, for me, cut and dried. At 14 in my private girls' school in D.C., two girls, I followed them to the bathroom. I heard them vomiting. Um, they came out. One was the daughter of a, of a Vogue model. And, and uh, she said she and her mother did it together. It was bulimia, you know, no big deal. The other one was a swimmer, fantastic swimmer. And I was too. And she said, look, this is great. You can eat whatever you want and get rid of it. So from 14 to 22, I fell into the abyss of not being able to stop. And that's when I be became very aware of the fact that this was a body, mind, and soul addiction. This wasn't something you take or leave if you come from a certain genetic background with a certain predisposition. And in my family, there's Olympians and there's alcoholics. I mean, there's depression. And I was, it, this was my drug of choice, food. So I got into it. I kept it in secret. Nobody knew, but I had all the warning signs. And in the late 70s, early 80s, nobody knew what the signs were. I mean, nobody knew what to look for. Um, you know, my teeth were crumbling. My gums were eroding. I didn't get my period until I was 21. I mean, I was a walking kind of dictionary example of bulimia and nobody knew. And so for seven, almost eight years, I just went undetected. But I was, I was hollow and um, wanted to die. 
uh, got to Harvard, just felt like a billboard. It's just like I had, I had these resume virtues, but nothing, nothing virtuous about my behavior or how I felt about myself. And it was all about me, getting my binges and getting away with them. So I lost my sport. I lost swimming eventually. I lost my friends. I lost my confidence. I lost everything. And then I asked them, the captain of the Harvard lacrosse team on our third date, if he'd marry me, because I thought, well, gee, maybe that'll take it away. Nothing else has worked. Uh, after I graduated, and in early 1984, I hit my last bottom in Baltimore, and I had nowhere to go until I saw one little ad um, in the Baltimore Sun saying there was a free self-help group for compulsive eaters. And it was that or a padded cell at a hospital. I mean, there was, there was no treatment. And I went there and that was the first place I heard one woman say, one woman, I'll call her Betsy. She said, my name is Betsy and I'm recovering from bulimia one day at a time. And I still get chills because that was the first time I'd heard anybody say all those words in one sentence, talk about it honestly, openly and say she was in recovery. And that night I got my life back at the age of 22 because somebody gave me hope. And until that moment, I think, everybody's assumption was you are going to be a bulimic for the rest of your life or you're going to die like Karen Carpenter. And that woman gave me hope. And so she gave me my life back. And that's been my mission ever since one way or another. It's not what I do professionally, but you can't keep what you don't give away. And I've given away my story of recovery to anyone who will listen, because if people have hope, they can do amazing things. What was so different about that particular low that made you, that drove you to seek help? I think it was one day I had binged and purged all day long. My husband was at a law firm, his law firm, and I think I was trying to find a job. We were newlyweds. And I just remember it was all day. It was, it was like a fugue state. And it was, um, I just remember feeling desperate. It didn't matter what I ate. Um, I was throwing up blood. I had vomit in my hair. Yeah. Um, it was, it was just about as, debased as, as you could be. And that night I said to my husband, when he came home first time, I said, I have a secret to tell you. And, um, you know, he could, his eyes just were like wide with shock. Like what you have a secret. You, we just got married <laughs> secret. And, uh, just telling one person allowed me to then decide that I was going to start looking anew. And that's when I think I was just like, I was just, primed to see that little ad. I think I just had no, I was going to lose everything. I had, you know, going to college hadn't cured me. Going to Harvard hadn't cured me. Getting married hadn't cured me. There was nothing else that was going to cure me. It was like the, the jig was up. It was that, claw your way back to life, figure this out or die. It was, it was like a stark choice. Hmm. If I were to say the term like hierarchy of eating disorders, do you know what that means? Do you, does it make sense to you? Do you agree with it or disagree with it? What does it mean? Okay. So it's, it's this idea of like anorexia is the, the pinnacle of eating disorders. Like that's the ideal. That's the romanticized, the glorified. If you have anorexia, you're competent and you're capable and you can achieve and you're a high achiever. And if you have bulimia, it's like, oh no, nobody wants that. You're kind of the outcast. You're kicked to the side. It's not as uh, seemingly glorified and then sort of binge eating is like the, the lowest on this, this hierarchy. I bring this up because I am curious why I feel like it's, it's people can understand in an odd way why somebody would have anorexia for years. Whereas bulimia to a person who's never had experience with eating disorders, they can be like, that's disgusting. How, how can you possibly do that? You're making yourself throw up. Ugh. It's just like, inherently so nasty and gross but i yeah. do think it's important to shine a light on why it is a thing that we keep going back to why it is a thing that that has has been a factor in our lives for years because there's so many people who don't who just don't get it and it's like we got to make some sense of that so why do you think that bulimia was a part of your life for that length of time what was it that kept you going back to it it was just this quick fix i mean i would i would um I, I had ADHD and was undiagnosed. And I, I believe in some level I was sedating myself with these mass binges. So I think I, I was uh, doing something chemical to my brain that might've helped me just kind of deal with both depression and ADHD. 
but it was an addiction, pure and simple. It was an addiction. Um, I, I just, the, the feeling of getting away with it and then somehow getting rid of the food. And it wasn't just vomiting. It was syrup of Ipecac. It was exercising too much. It was, um, what are other ways you deal with food? Just sitting with it, having like shades of binge eating disorder. It's not just the vomiting, but the tremendous shame that went along with that behavior. Because right, nobody, when you think about when you throw up, you're, you're incredibly sick. I've heard that comment thousands and thousands of times. Like, how could you do that? I always feel terrible when I vomit. And it's like, I have to say to them, when you throw up as a bulimic, it is not even close to what you feel when you're um, sick with the flu. It's a completely different feeling. Yeah. No comparison. So you first, people have to get that. But, um, you know, if you got rid of the food, then somehow it was reset to zero. And then you could go back to Baskin Robbins. You could go back, whatever. It was like a secret. And it was, I never have to pay the price for this terrible secret. There were times I wished I'd had binge eating disorder and just gotten fat. and. Um, Everyone would have known, but the fact that it was so easy to hide and that it's eight to 10 times more common than anorexia means that we all know many people with bulimia and we don't know who they are yet. Yes. And the mortality rate is shockingly high. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's scary. And I feel like it's so common from the outside for maybe eating disorders to be viewed as this like, woe is me or like a shallow or a vain thing when I, I, from, from my experience, from everybody that I've met who's struggled with eating disorders, it's rarely an issue of vanity. It's almost always, it almost always seems to be a coping mechanism, something that they turn to, to, to quell pain or to cope with the trauma. It's, it's so much bigger than just some like shallow little dinky thing that a couple girls in high school have. Right. I mean, I think there were a lot of, um, um, stereotypes about bulimics being these spoiled sorority girls when I got into it. I first, you know, heard that it was, you know, racing through sororities and it was part of uh, hazing rituals. They would all go in the bathroom together after binging and whatever. I mean, but it did have this kind of connotation that it's just spoiled rich girls when in fact, certainly over the last 35 years, I've heard from hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, it crosses all cultural lines, crosses all racial lines. It's, it's everywhere. Um, and so I do think there's been a misconception about that, but none of us ever wake up every day and think this is how I want to spend my day. Nobody, nobody desires this life. Certainly I didn't. I just remember thinking that I was losing day after day, year after year of my life. And I was a shell of myself. I didn't even recognize who I was. And I was so deep in my secrecy, um, that, um, nobody could reach me and yes. I back. When I got in recovery, that was the amazing thing. It's like I was going through life with one arm tied behind my back. And look at you. Look at Princess Diana. Look at so many of the people, tennis stars. Um, I, I could, we could both go on and on about the famous people who've acknowledged the Olympic swimmers uh, who, have, who acknowledged that they competed at the highest level of sport, the highest level of society, and they succeeded. Imagine, imagine how much more amazing any of our performances would have been if we hadn't had this part-time job called bulimia with one arm tied behind our back. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. And that's what makes bulimia to me so dangerous and so insidious because anorexics, you spot them. You know, it's, it's, it's rarer, certainly, but it's a different profile of person who gets it. Um, but the rest of us, no one's calling us on it because we look so normal. In fact, I kind of looked like this 35 years ago. Yes call me on it nobody wow you mentioned that you had sort of shades of binge eating disorder did you ever swing in into the pendulum of anorexia or no yeah i started i i think i started with restricting um because i think well my, my parents i mean my mother was just a very damaged borderline woman and i was her target of wait to get into that oh i cannot wait because this is this is the part of which you are not allowed to speak. Um, so it's it's a, that's a whole different story. But my my dad, you know, would comment about my weight, and I just remember I decided to, you know, try to diet. And the next thing I know, after getting a really low weight, I can't remember what it was, but it was low by my standards. Not 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 really anorexic. One night I had a piece of banana bread, and then it was off to the races. I mean, I never looked back. Anorexia never entered my life after that. After that moment, it was always bulimia, always. 
Mm. Before we get into recovery, I'll give the listeners some context for, for my history with eating disorders in case they don't know. Um, when I was 11, my mom introduced me to anorexia. She introduced me to it through calling it calorie restriction. And it was in an attempt to help me look younger for my age so that I would, I was a child actor and so that I would book more roles. She told me about this cool thing called calorie restriction so that I could continue to play like seven, eight year olds when I'm like 12, 13. So that was my, my first introduction. And I struggled with anorexia from 11 to 14. And then my eating somewhat normalized from 15 to 16 until I got my period. Then that terrified me and set me off into anorexia again. So I thought, oh no, don't want to be a woman. Don't want to grow up. Got to stay young. And then by 18, my mother was diagnosed with cancer for the second time. And I went into binge eating disorder a bit then. And then at 21, as her death was clearly very imminent, I fell to anorexia for a few months. And then bulimia the week that she died, literally the week that she died. And struggled with bulimia for over three years. And that was the most hellish eating disorder to me. And the one that I felt I had the least control over, the one that I felt the most shame about. When I had anorexia, I did feel, you know, I hate saying it because I, I don't want to in any way romanticize it, but I do think it's important to be honest about the feelings to make sense of them. But I did feel like I was achieving something, like I was succeeding at something, as warped as that thinking was. And I recognize that now. But with bulimia, I just felt like shit. I felt like I was a fucking failure. I felt like, how come I can't have anorexia? Why do I have this one? Why am, why, why am I even failing at eating disorders? When am I going to get my shit together? Yet I felt absolutely unable to control it. Yeah. It took everything out of me. And looking back on it now, I am really... The, the thing that I'm most disappointed in is that I, I wasted so much of my life is how I see it. You brought up the point of feeling as if you had one hand tied behind your back. And that is exactly it. It's like I was going through the motion. I was not present. I wasn't yeah. myself. I was not able to be intimate with people because I was only intimate with food and only obsessing about the, whatever the eating disorder was that I was presented with at the time. Yeah. I think recovery is is so important to focus on and talk about yeah so that people can see that especially if they're struggling right now that th that's not the the end point that's not the answer there is hope and especially the difference between my life then and my life now i had no idea that life could feel the way that it feels now i had no i didn't know what quality of life was quality of like no that was i had zero quality of life and now it's just every day looks and feels so different so that said that's i would love to kind of get into your um your process of recovery how that started for you what that looked like what motivated you all of it um, wow. First, I want to say congratulations. I mean, that's your real story. And there's a lot there to, to look at and feel proud of. Even if you feel like you lost years, there's a lot of triumph in that story, too. Um, I think the reason I wanted to live is because I'd found somebody who loved me. And he wasn't expecting me to get great grades or play, you know, Beethoven's Concerto number one uh on the piano i mean it was just it was love i mean i met him at harvard i you know as i said i asked him to marry me um but we've been married for many decades now we've got three adult children and there was something about just being with him that you know suddenly i got my period you know at the age of 22 and um <laughs> and I, I i wanted to live i knew that if i could live if i could beat this thing we were gonna have fun and we were going to, i was going to find joy and that was what motivated me. And then meeting Betsy and then these other people in Baltimore, I was very fortunate to hit my bottom in Baltimore because 12-step groups, I'm just going to name it Overeaters Anonymous, yeah. actually full of people who were in recovery from bulimia. And it wasn't because Shepard Pratt was churning out people in recovery. It was, I think, one person inspired another person inspired another person. I think that's how it starts. Um, and so... I had a few relapses early on. I wrote about those in My Name is Caroline. But then one day I realized that I was 
not just a week or a month, I was several years in recovery. And I wasn't thinking about food and I wasn't planning my meals and I wasn't calling someone every morning to tell them what I was going to eat. And I wasn't, I had, I had a life again. I was able to think. And, um, and then I got pregnant. Uh, there was a point there where I honestly didn't think I could have children because of the damage I did to my body. I mean, you probably know this too, but 60% of the people in infertility clinics are women who have eating disorder histories because of the damage we've done to our bodies. And just as I was about to give up on having a baby, I had a dream where I saw the Virgin Mary, and I'm not Catholic, but uh, you know there was this pulsing blue light around her. And then a little boy with yellow curly hair reached his hand at me and said, I'm coming to stay with you. And I woke up and I said to my husband, I'm pregnant and it's a little boy and he's got curly hair and all the rest of it. I not in that dream. And I think that was the next turning point is I became a mother. And that is what my son ended up looking like. He looked exactly like he looked in that dream. It's still so bizarre to me. But that was a turning point. I, I began to want to be a better person so that I could raise good people. And then I had a daughter, Samantha, and I knew that if I was privileged enough to have a daughter, I was going to have to do so many things right that were not done for me. And that became a different you know, reason to continue to recover. But all along the way, I knew that hundreds of thousands of people had looked to me for their first role modeling. I didn't, didn't know this was going to happen. Nobody can know this happens when you're the first person to actually do this. Yeah. But I realized that I was staying in recovery for lots and lots of people. And I, I needed to never let people down. And um, I ended up having to not just be in therapy, but I went on antidepressants. Um, I went on, I won't say what it is, but one of them worked better for me than another one. So that was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this on my own. All right, well, I guess I'll do that. So I was dealing with that. I got therapy, group therapy. And then finally, I had to deal with the demons at home, which was my biological family. And I realized that I was, if I was going to go back and tell the story of how I didn't just get in recovery, because that was the holy grail forever. Can you get in recovery? It was like nobody thought that was possible. So then that became possible. We, we started finding out 37 years ago, you could get in recovery. But then a couple of years ago, I realized that there was no book on staying in recovery. And that was really the bigger challenge, staying in recovery. Yep. I realized that I had to then go back and I kept waiting for someone else to write that book. And nobody did. And I was like, okay, this isn't my field. It's not what I do for a living, but I'm going to tell the, the, the rest of the story now of how I stayed in recovery. And I had to reveal some really brutal things because I wanted people to know that if you don't have a family of choice, I mean, a family, biological family, that's going to be there for you. You can create a family of choice because I've always been mystified by this whole family systems approach to recovery as if that's the way everyone should should accomplish this what if what if you've got a borderline mother who, who literally wants to destroy you and a father who abuses you that's what was i going to do there was no family therapy for me and so i created a family of choice and to do that i had to tell people that story and that was the hardest thing i think i've ever done is to tell the truth about that part of my recovery wow wow to somebody who might be currently struggling with an eating disorder, how would you describe to them what being recovered looks like? Because I feel like it can just be this fantasy that's like, I don't even, uh, what is it? Gosh, it's probably a little different for everybody. But for me, it's about waking up and not worrying what I'm going to eat, not thinking about where can I go to a restaurant, not wondering where the bathrooms are. It's about a full life and it's about joy and it's about happiness. And, and when I went back to Penn and got a master's in positive psychology in 2005, 2006, I remember replaying my life in reverse in my head yeah. as I grew it because I realized that I hadn't known true happiness during any of those years when I had an eating disorder. But now I didn't just know what it was intellectually from all this research. I was living it. And that's why I wanted to include the positive psychology research in Positively Caroline. Um, but it's a life without limits and it's a hopeful life and um, it's a grateful life. And then I think I really learned what my purpose was, um, which was, I remember someone saying to me, Caroline, it's great. You're getting in recovery. That's great. But you know what? You can't keep what you don't give away. You better turn around and pull people with you. 
And that was that moment early in recovery was when I realized that that was how I wanted to live my life. I wanted to give away good things so that other people could benefit, not just from my recovery, but other things. And that's the way I've lived my life for 35 years. And that's real joy. Mm -hmm. Something that I think was really important that your book, Positively Caroline, focused on was how recovery doesn't mean that just all your problems go away. And now that you don't have an eating disorder, you're just skipping around and wearing a bonnet. I don't know where you're wearing a bonnet, but you're just like in fields of daisies and just like loving life. Because I think that's what I, what I expected when I heard the idea of recovery, I expected that that would mean that I just had, that all my problems went away. It's my extreme thinking. But as you describe in your book, there was a lot of stuff that was happening that was not easy to overcome. And I think that speaks even more to your level of recovery that you didn't return to any yeah. eating disorder behaviors in the midst of some of that stuff that came your way. Were, were there moments, were there incidences that you can remember where it was really challenging to not return to bulimia or was it just kind of an, a, a non-question for you, just an, a, non, a non-conversation? That's a really good question. I, I don't think bulimia ever was a way I was coping with the pain of dealing with my family of origin issues. I probably wanted a drink more than I wanted a binge, but I've been sober for 35 years too. So there were times it was like, this is painful. And, um, but I knew, I, I think I, I, I often get asked, how, what are the main reasons why you stayed in recovery? I firmly believe that giving up alcohol is a huge piece of why I've stayed in recovery because it removes the slippery slope of should I, shouldn't I? And so um, there were times I just wanted to obliterate myself. It's like, this is too hard. So I would look at alcohol, whatever, and I'd think, just one drink and it's like no so that was really what called to me but i've never i've never gone backwards i've never used anything that would alter my consciousness i knew that the only way out was through and um and i was doing it many ways for my daughter who's taller than i am i knew she was going to get all the comments i was going to get and more and i knew i had to be that role model not just for my two sons but my daughter in particular because life is hard for women you know that it's still hard changed a little bit since I was younger, but it's really hard. I mean, the, the comments we get about our bodies, I mean, just look at Kamala Harris and the comments or Hillary Clinton. I mean, or even Amy, Amy Coney Barrett being asked who does the laundry. I mean, it's insane how many things we're expected to do and what we're expected to look like. And so I do, I did want to live in full recovery for my daughter and get through the really challenging parts of dealing with my mother in particular. Mm. Can we go into the mom stuff? Yeah, we can. When I saw the name of your play, I laughed so hard out loud that I'm sure the offices around me were wondering. I was like, I'll bet no one understands this except people like me. (laughs) No, that makes me so happy. You're correct. There are many people who met that title with like, how can you say that? How dare you say that? And it's like, well, I'm going to have to see the show. (laughs) I explain it, but if you're not going to see it, then that's fine. And I also thought it would be a nice way of keeping out the people that are going to be those like, no, how dare you types. Interesting. Huh? So you thought, you thought through the title. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Immediately. I'm so glad. And that's exactly the that means so much because it's, it means that it's speaking to exactly who it's supposed to be speaking to, you know? Um, can you give listeners just kind of a, a, an explanation of what your situation was like with your, with your mother? My, my mother um, grew up in a family where she was the only child. My grandfather was an alcoholic, an abusive alcoholic. My, my wonderful, wonderful grandmother, who's a Christian scientist, left him in the depression and i think it scarred my mother i'm i'm guessing other things happened too that i don't know about but for whatever reason therapy would have helped her she chose to take all of her fury out on me the middle child there was something about me that infuriated my mother so my mother is what's called the witch borderline and when those borderline mother books came out in the mid 1990s i remember a therapist suggesting it to me and i remember getting one of them like overcoming borderline mother and i remember throwing it so hard against the room i broke something because it just everything lit up again i was like this isn't like being the child of an alcoholic or whatever 
my mother hated me and my father confirmed it for me right before he died. It was like I was driving by him on the street. He was walking home from a pool near where we were both living at the time. He held his hand up and he had shy Drager. So it was it was hard for him to hold his hand up. And I pulled pulled over and he said, I just need you to know that your mother never loved you. And um, I don't know why he said we used to fight about it, but um, and it was like he had to get it off his chest. And I know. And it's when I've told people this story, they they just go, oh, how awful. I had the exact opposite reaction. I just remember seeing molecules of air rearranging themselves. It was like I suddenly was in an altered state. And I just saw puzzle pieces dropping into place. And I thought, I'm not crazy. That's what, what the reality was. Because everyone says, oh, your mother loved you. She just didn't express it. I, of course, she loved you in her own way. It's like, don't go there with me because you don't understand what I lived through. I mean, I could, I could raise your, your hair and your scalp with how many things she did that were just trying to destroy me there was a time she passed me in public and pretended she didn't know who i was with my friends and i predicted it i said she's walking towards us that's my mother those are her friends i predict she's going to pretend she doesn't know who i am and then when that happened i remember one woman threw her arms out because we crossed on this path and she said i knew your mother was bad but i've never seen that and i hope i never see a mother pretending her child isn't hers ever again. Mm. But it's hard to describe to people because most people believe in the Hallmark version, like all mothers love their children. My mother didn't love me and she did everything she could do to hurt me and damage me. And to this day, as she lies in a home in a, an assisted living place, that is still her motivation. She hates me and I've accepted it, but I've healed from that and I've recovered. But people need to understand that that doesn't need to stand in the way of recovery. You can create a family of choice. And that is what I did. And that's part of the reason why I healed. And people needed to hear that. There's too many eating disorder stories I read about where parents having these come to Jesus meetings with their children and everything was sweetness and light. It's like, that's not the reality. Because I now believe that there are so many borderline daughters of borderline mothers who are spectacular women who've survived and thrived in spite of their mothers. And it's the problem we're not allowed to talk about. And yet, if you don't, I wasn't going to be able to finish the true story of why I got in recovery and stayed in recovery. Uh, several therapists have, I've sort of given them the rundown of my mother because my mother refused to admit that she had a problem. She, my, my father, my grandfather would beg and plead for her to get help. I mean, her relationship with my father was so tumultuous. She'd throw things, she'd kick things, she'd slam car doors on him. Um, the whole house operated on when's mom going to have the next breakdown? When's mom going to, what's mom going to be doing this time? And who's, who's going to be responsible for, for the problem? One of my brothers tended most often to be the problem child. She would tell him, you're my least favorite child in front of all of us. Like we were all, we all knew. And I was the one who was expected to always do, I was like the trophy child. I was always expected to do what she wanted and meet the mark and the high expectations and be exactly who she wanted me to be. And that was an honor to me. I loved that role. I thought, great, she, mom doesn't trust anybody else. I'm the only one who has a chance of making mom happy. Of course, now realizing how problematic that was, but therapists have, have, have said that it sounds like she either has borderline or narcissistic personality disorder or I guess a combination of the two, they often work hand in hand. And that was really a tough pill for me to swallow when that was told to me because they, narcissistic personality disorder means that they're sort of incapable of empathy. That's like part of the, the definition. And that meant reframing the way that I had seen my mom for all those years. This, this woman, I idolized, I worshiped her. She was everything to me she was my hero she was my reason for living i mean it was i would tell her often if, if you died i would just kill myself like that's not what a nine-year-old says and my mom would just beam and be so happy this was all through her conditioning yeah so to get to that point where it's like holy shit my whole that whole childhood adolescent experience was through her curation that was her conditioning that was her grooming she wanted me to be that way 
She wanted me to have no life purpose except for herself because she had no identity herself. She had nothing to live for. So she made me live for her. That was, that was real tough. And yet I was, as I was figuring all that out and I would try to express what I was piecing together to people, it was always the same fucking narrative of, no, your mother loved you, loved you. No, no, no. She was so great. No, she, you just don't know how hard it is to be a mom. I heard that so many times. And well, I'm, right. And it's like, yeah, I get that. I don't know how hard it is to be a mom. I totally get that. But still, there aren't excuses. That's not an excuse for her behavior. No. And there's a reason why borderlines are called the unhelpables. They don't want help and they don't think they need help. And they function so well outside of the house you know in structured society they're so charming my mother was so charming and beautiful and the rest of it but boy the wheels came off the bus the minute i i got in the house and, and my father would hit me and my mother would watch i mean i gotta tell you i mean if anyone had the slightest idea what was really going on school became my escape swimming was my escape but really i do believe my eating disorder kept me alive um, because I might have killed myself if I hadn't had this release. As sick as it was, there is a school of thought in therapy that for some bulimics, this is actually what kept you alive. And I believe it kept me alive, even with all of the side effects and all of the, the losses I experienced. I mm. still think it was the best thing that ever happened to me, but I think it was how I survived my mother and, and, a, and a household that Remember, my first therapist was shocked I wasn't autistic and rocking back and forth, clutching myself. And, and I, I would relate these stories very dispassionately, like being locked in a cage in the basement. They'd say, say what? what? What'd you say? I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, this, this was normal. Yeah. No, it was. It was. It was and, and then I've, I've been vilified for actually telling the truth. And I haven't told everything. Because there are things about my recovery that probably aren't going to help other people to know. I told enough that I knew that what I, sh I shared in opening the kimono was enough to give people an idea that you don't need a perfect family to get in recovery. And that mm. was my goal. You really have to understand that it's not all perfect after you get in recovery. To stay in recovery, there are more demons to slay. And you can do it so important i'm also curious about your partner's impact on your recovery yeah. i was very fortunate in that i met my now partner uh, at the point of my recovery i had done i was maybe a year into my recovery when i met him and he was so instrumental in helping me to normalize my relationship with food my body it was such a loving safe environment that I had never had. I'd never experienced that kind of acceptance toward me before. Um, that I think it was, I, I, I don't know what, what my recovery, I know that I would have really, I would have really tried, but I don't think it would have gone nearly as smoothly or nearly as quickly had it not been for him. Yeah. Um, well, my husband I think, had to become educated along with the rest of the world about what bulimia was. I mean, now everyone knows what it is, but he would go to these 12 step meetings with me and sit there and just, you know, cause there were meetings that were open meetings, you know, someone could come who loved the person who was struggling with food. But I think he had to learn along the way that there was nothing he could really do other than not have ice cream in the house for a while. I mean, my binge foods were sometimes his favorite food. So it's like, okay, in the beginning out, and, um, you know, so he gave up some of his pleasures in order for me to bond with other people and do what I needed to do to get better. Um, there was no judgment. There was no rushing me into recovery. Oh, aren't you recovered yet? So I, I think that, and, and I said no scales in the house, you know, nobody ever fought me on that. I mean, there could have been some kind of pushback, but there really never was. And he loved me because of what I brought to the table in our relationship. I didn't have to look a certain way or weigh, weigh a certain thing. And for that, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. I want to quickly say that I think this pandemic, all the reporting you're seeing during the pandemic has worried me a little bit. And I thought about uh, writing an article about the fact that every article I see about food during the pandemic is about relapse. 
no one's written about the fact that they've stayed in recovery. And someone's got to put the hope out there because we become what we read. We become what we expect. It's called expectancy theory. And there are no articles about hopeful getting through it. Here's what we did. I mean, for God's sake, there are meetings online now. When I got into my recovery, there were no therapists who understood it, nowhere to go. There were no books. There was no internet. And guess what? You can recover. Now there's so many tools. And yet the articles I see about food and the pandemic are all dire. Yeah. It's like, people, let's flip the script upside down and write about the ways we've recovered from it and how we're staying in recovery. Let's learn from people who are in recovery. And that's another thing I fault the eating disorder community on is they should have lined up by now at least 10 of us who've been in recovery for 20, 25 years. No yeah. And they should have unpacked our stories. I mean, they've done this with smoking. They've done it with... Um, weight loss they've done it with uh addiction opioids whatever and they haven't done it in the eating disorder world we became highly politicized as i got out of it and it became all about follow the money and people lining up to associate themselves with a certain treatment modality and then referring patients so they would get money i mean i've remained switzerland i don't want to affiliate myself with one way or another i just want people to have hope that they can recover and um, they should have unpacked those of us who've made it in, into recovery. They've got to be common denominators. This is how case studies are written. This is how people learn what works. Why has this not been done? I mean, I'm the most public recovered bulimic out there. Yeah. In some ways. Why isn't my phone not ringing off the hook saying, can we interview you for two hours? When my name is Caroline came out, the New York Times Sunday book review reviewed it and said it was revolting and that I didn't love my husband. That is... That was the environment back then. God, God, thank you. God. It's changed and we can talk about it. Yeah. I was considered a bad human being, a revolting human being for writing that first book that saved so many lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, no wonder it's so hard for people to have honest conversations about this. Yes. Yes. I hope you write the article. Please do. I'll be the first one reading it. I... I'm so glad that you brought up what's wrong with the eating disorder community because I certainly have my qualms with it. And it's something that I have felt resistant to talking about because it's like, well, shoot, I don't want to step on toes. Shoot, I don't want to offend people. But I would love to, I know we've just got to, we've got to wrap up here, but I would love to kind of go into that territory for a couple minutes and then let you go if that's, if that's cool with you. And I Again, there's so many topics to this, to explore, and I would I, I'd do this again in a heartbeat because it's so important. Please, I would absolutely love that. I think it's uh, there. You are uh, the the what's the saying? The poster child for being recovered. So the more I am in recovery, I'm healthy. I'm swimming competitively without all the stuff I had in high school. You get your life back. You get, yeah. and people need to know that. Hmm. One of my uh, biggest issues I have many with the eating disorder community is the sensitivity and not being able to, there are so many trigger warnings that, I mean, this conversation we're having right now would be, it's, it's in some circles unheard of, unfathomable, ridiculous. But I think that the sensitivity is actually hugely destructive and holds so many people back from recovery. I feel very passionate about sharing that because I just think people have got to work through these sensitivities and hear some things they're uncomfortable hearing in order to get to the other side. How do you feel about the sensitivity? God, you're preaching to the choir. When I wrote the book, Getting Grit, my, my seventh book, my most recent book, I wrote about these trigger warnings and how absurd they've gotten. And I've said to so many people, if that concept had been around 35 years ago, I never would have gotten into recovery. Why? Because the whole frigging world was a trigger. Yeah. place that we had drive through fried chicken that was a, a i mean the whole world was a trigger warning how in the hell does anybody become resilient and gritty unless they learn to deal with uncomfortable ideas and thoughts and whatever it is absurd it has set people back so many years it's bullshit i am so angry that that concept is out there because we're not fabergé eggs there's this whole i'm sitting here with this book anti-fragile we have to become resilient. Mm. And I do believe the reason I've cultivated grit is because I recovered from my eating disorder. I didn't have it before. I had talent and success, not 
grit. If you get in recovery, you will have to face triggers. They'll be on television. They'll be when you're driving. They'll be when you're shopping for food. My God, get used to it. Toughen up, people. <laughs> Oh, I love the passion. You're so funny too. I believe you said that because I have not had the guts to say that publicly, but I feel so, well, I have said it privately, but you know, people don't do these interviews about this topic. No. Stop. It's doing damage. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I also feel like there's, there's such a competitive nature to being in eating disorders and this might be somewhat controversial, but I wish that that competitiveness could be transferred into recovery because if, we, if, if we've got competitive personalities anyway, let's just assume we do, if we have them, we might as well apply them towards something good. And the, the destruction, the eating disorders, not helping anything great. You won the eating disorder contest. Like that is really not, not an accomplishment and it needs to be said. But if we were able to apply the like, no, I've been in recovery for this long. No, I'm doing, you know, obviously being honest, I could see a version of, of that world where then people are like faking recovery. Not what I'm talking about at all. Just, just be, just being honest and open about our recovery to inspire others and to get them to want the same thing and to show how possible it is. I think the competitiveness that took me to the dark side of bulimia was, was trying to be the best bulimic. And when I flipped that energy on its head and tried to become the best version of recovery I could be, that was when everything changed. So I think everyone's recovery looks a little bit different, but I think there has to be an abstaining from the kind of behavior that defines an eating disorder. So that has to be part of the definition. I'll never forget going to England with one of my best friends in like the year 2000. And on the third day of living with her and being with another friend, I remember she said to me in bewilderment, you don't really have that thing anymore, do you? And I just looked at her and was like, what? What do you mean? She said, oh, you really don't have an eating disorder, do you? And I remember thinking, did you think, did you think I did? And that's when I realized that you can't prove you're in recovery because there's so many ways to get away with it. If you're bulimic, you look pretty normal for the most part. And so your recovery has to be for yourself because people may doubt you forever. That's their prerogative, I guess. But I didn't even know my recovery was in doubt until that moment. I realized, I thought there are a lot of people who think that I have faux grit, that I'm just making this all up. But you know what? Watch me. Come, come live with me. Go to bathrooms with me. I mean, after a few days, you, you go, okay, she's got it. You know, this is not a joke. No. I'm thrilled that you bring this up. I had so many people challenge a, a lot of my family members, to be frank, didn't realize that I had an eating disorder. They didn't know. And then once I posted this article and they saw it, then, I, then all of a sudden everybody was very concerned all the time and monitoring my food. And I thought like, dude, like now I'm good. I'm, I'm good to go. It was three years ago that I was struggling, 10 years ago that I was struggling, 15 years ago that I was struggling. Now everything's solid. Um, but I do think that recovery is, is really easy to doubt. I actually, I have a lot of people comment now, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite thin. And when I was struggling with bulimia, I was actually heavier than I am now. And I think that's another kind of difficult concept for some people to wrap their, their heads around, but it's like, look, yeah, recovery doesn't have, or, or eating disorders don't have a face and a shape and a, they're not a, just one look type of thing. Same thing with recovery. It looks different for everybody. And I think that's, that's something that needs to be said because it can, I, I can see how it's confusing to people, but hopefully hearing that will, will make it less confusing. Porter played the game of gotcha with me. She had been a White House reporter and there was, I was in a documentary and I was picked to be the bulimic. And I'll never forget after a commercial break, she leaned in and said something about my body. And then she said, but you're very thin. And she was trying to rock me. And then I just, I said, you know what? I was heavier when I was bulimic. Look at my parents. I inherited their body type. This is what I was meant to look like. This here now. But the, but people don't understand recovery and how it looks different on everyone. There's still so many misconceptions about this. It makes me so sad. Where, where have we really gotten in the last 35 years since I kind of broke the airways and said, here I am. This is what we look like. I'm your sister, your daughter, your friend, whatever. This is who we are. Guess what? We walk and talk and speak. And you know what? We don't want to do this. This is not how we wake up and want to live. I mean, I think there's still so many areas we need to make more progress. 
And I know you're going to make a difference with a lot of people. And I'm so grateful you're doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you. I, I love how on Positively Caroline, you actually have the side-by-side pictures from My Name is Caroline and Positively Caroline to show people how similar recovery from struggling person with an eating disorder can look. I thought that was, it, it's the first time I'd seen somebody do that and talk about that topic. And I'm so glad I think, I think you're talking about uh, eating disorders in all of the right ways. And I, I am eager for more material from you. Again, we'll do it again. There's a lot that needs to be done. And I think the world's been waiting for someone like you with your followers in this period where so many people are listening to things like this and talking about food because of the pandemic. Um, you're going to save a lot of lives. I'm telling you right now, I know what's going to happen. You're going to save a lot of lives. And thank you for helping me bring this story back. Thank you so much.